Is blockchain technology the answer to achieving supply chain transparency? My guest is Paul Brody, blockchain leader of EY. Hello, Paul. Hi there. Thanks for having me. And thank you for being with me. So what is the current status of blockchain as a means of achieving transparent and secure end-to-end tracking and supply chains? So the current status is actually that it's making a lot of progress, and particularly with regard to transparency and traceability, it's moving along very nicely. We've gone over the last couple of years from, hey, let me do a little pilot, I want to do a proof of concept, to now into large-scale production. We're into large-scale production with some nuances as well. So we're starting to do things like bill of materials modeling, merging raw materials into finished goods, tracking lots. We're doing everything from bottles of wine to uh, vaccines, raw materials. Uh, food. So it's become a really big business. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's probably in terms of industrial applications, our single largest business. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's pretty impressive. So you're saying that in many companies or in many instances, it's beyond the pilot stage? Oh, absolutely. It's in full production. Uh, it's moving at scale. Companies are even experimenting with sort of new ways of doing things. So early on, for example, we did things that were sort of immature, like we would uh, notarize documents tracking and implementation. But mm-hmm. right now where we are is we are creating tokens. We're creating NFTs. Peroni Italy is a really good example. We create a new NFT with each batch of beer. So we cannot just have like, we can have uh, product traceability, batch traceability, right? It's maturing. It's matured beyond like I'm just tam- time stamping a document and, and creating history. Mm-hmm. And then we're also starting to do things like location tracking. So we've just submitted an EIP, what's called an Ethereum Improvement Proposal to do a couple of things. Number one, to track locations, standard metadata base, so you can track the location of an item with a token that represents an asset. And then secondly, uh, we've created a standardized model of attaching a URL or a URI that supports both mutable and immutable data attached mm-hmm. to it. So we can have immutable data, like this is a batch of beer it was produced at this time, and we can also have mutable data, like it's in this warehouse at this location. So uh, we're starting to get quite sophisticated in our implementation of traceability. I, I don't even know where to begin with all the questions I have about that. I, I, first of all, I thought that immutable was, was the whole point of blockchain, uh, that the data is, cannot be changed uh, once it goes up on a blockchain, but you're saying that necessarily isn't the case. If the data needs to be changed, it can be, right? So the blockchain record can't be changed, but yeah. let's, say I have a, let's say I create a, a record of a batch of beer for Peroni, and I put this on the blockchain. Mm-hmm. Right now that there's immutable things about that record, like the history, what happened to it, et cetera. But there's also things that change from time to time, like where is it located, uh, which distributor has it and things like that. So and when you look at a token on the blockchain, you'd like to see both the, the immutable history data and the current status. Mm-hmm. And so what we've done is we've tried to create a way where you can access both. The stuff that needs to be immutable, that doesn't change, that is is immutable and doesn't change. The stuff that's up to date, that stuff can be continuously updated. So that's our key I see. Goal. Does this involve the participation of miners in order to place uh, place something in a blo- on a block? Every every block, every transaction involves the, the use of miners. But when you're updating mutable data, what you're actually doing is you're updating a URL with off-chain storage and the mutable data points you to that off-chain storage that gets continuously updated. I so see. that's how we try to handle things like the split between immutable data that we don't ever want change and we want this permanent record of that stuff really goes on-chain as a transaction and mutable data there we want a pointer to that data but that data can change over time. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, recently blockchain and, and also more specifically cryptocurrency have come under a lot of criticism for the incredible energy uh, intensiveness of this technology. Is that still the case? Is that being solved in any way when blockchain has is related to supply chain issues? Uh, yes. Yeah, so m- almost all the criticism and discussion of this is centered on Bitcoin, which is not what we use. We use mm-hmm. Ethereum and we use an Ethereum layer two called Polygon. Um, Ethereum itself is something like 90 times more sort of energy efficient than Bitcoin. And uh, that in turn uh, is, is in shifting to something called proof of stake from proof of work. That mm-hmm. in turn will make it again 99% more efficient than it currently is. So the carbon footprint issue is, I think, is an intermittent one. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a transient issue for supply chain on Ethereum. 
it's a bit more of a substantial issue for Bitcoin, uh, and that's going to be addressed. It's going to have to be addressed by um, renewable energy inputs into the mining process. Mm -hmm. Is proof of state an actual, uh, uh, does it make sense as a replacement for proof of work? Because that, does that not favor those who already have the greatest share of, of assets and they can control what's going on on the blockchain because they have the, the bigger stake? Uh, yes, although it is a still a relatively decentralized system and will become more so. And then you can also look at the layer twos, which are, are proof of stake based and are a secondary layer. So you, you have a more uh, equal access into those. So I feel pretty optimistic that it's not there's no risk of like a 51 percent attack in the Ethereum ecosystem, uh, at least that I see it right mm -hmm. now. You referenced NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which of course have been in the news for other reasons, works of art and little clips of videos and things like that. I'm sure that's not what we're talking about here. What is owned in a blockchain that is created for supply chain tracking when an NFT is involved? You're owning a piece of code, but, but what exactly are you owning and, and why does NFTs come in? Why do NFTs come into the picture at all? So non-fungible tokens are really can be used for any kind of unique asset. So if you think about a batch of beer, it's it is a batch of beer, and in theory, like a beer should you know your beer from your your system should taste the same all the time. But in reality, each batch is you know slightly unique, and for health and safety and traceability reasons, you want to keep track of that. When you own an NFT in that circumstance, you just have to copy data. It's not like ownership of the beer itself. Mm -hmm. What we do want to get to though is NFTs and tokens that represent not just the traceability but the ownership and the location, because traceability is nuts, but if you want to manage my supply chain effectively, I really want to have, I want to have traceability, I want to have supply chain management, I want to have inventory management. I believe blockchain isn't just the future of traceability, it's the future of procurement transactions, the future of multi party supply chain management. Mm -hmm. To do that, that token should represent the location and the ownership. You reference, do you not, to the notion of an autonomous supply chain, the use of smart contracts. Where does blockchain come in in creating this so-called autonomous supply chain? And what, for that matter, is it an autonomous supply chain? So I've been working in supply chain for a long time. I, I was part of some of the early work I2 Technologies. It was a lot of fun. I remember uh, asking one of my colleagues early on, I said, the client keeps talking about Excel. Is it like a supply chain planning system that has the same name as the spreadsheet? They're like, no, no. That's the spreadsheet they're talking about. <laughs> they're running their $20 billion oh, supply chain on a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we've improved, but we're still very manually. And, and what I think would be really fantastic is smart contracts can do things. The beauty of smart contracts is that they can do things automatically on their own in response to condition. Mm -hmm. So imagine you have a smart contract that's looking over an inventory position, right? It's got a min, it's got a max, it's got an, an economic order quantity. When it falls below... The minimum, it can just say, hey, I want to reorder, and it can do it automatically. Mm -hmm. And when I think about, you know, some of the crowdsource and really modern supply chains that we're seeing evolve today, the thing that's exciting for me is these things are, these things are not top-down driven, right? If you think about car ride-sharing services or apartment-sharing services, they're bottom-up driven, right? Yeah. They're driven by the individual participants. We can make individual buffers and, and storage locations in the supply chain in that sense, autonomous with smart contracts, they can reorder for themselves within orders. We can have self-organizing, automated, autonomous supply chains. What obstacles stand in the way of blockchain becoming a mature and a widely used technology for this purpose that we're talking about today? So I think there's a couple of things. First of all, we've got to get more comfortable with the traceability, right? Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, we've got to, to improve and mature the privacy component, right? When you're doing traceability because you want the consumer to see that you had uh, um, organic inputs into your supply chain, that's something you want everybody to see. What you don't want people to see is how many cases of beer you have in each particular Walmart or Safeway or Whole Foods, right? Mm -hmm. So we need more mature handling of privacy. Um, we need uh, the ability for uh, more and more participants to log in and integrate easily. So we've been working on things like EDI integration. So much of the world depends on EDI. It would be really important and useful and where we're prioritizing EDI integration, SAP integration, so that you can plug your enterprise system directly onto the blockchain, and move data around with privacy, with security, and tie these together in business contracts and payments. So there's still a huge amount of work to be done, even mm -hmm. though this business is starting to mature really nicely in quite a few ways.
What about the issue of scale? We hear that getting stuff on the blockchain, it's a time consuming process and the, you know, the, the speed of transactions is quite slow. So there, there are, there's, there's scale and transaction processing speed, which have both historically been issues. They're both being addressed in, in different ways. So uh, the first way in which they're being addressed is with the creation of layer twos. So what layer two solutions do in the world of Ethereum is they allow me to take uh, a, a, a if you think of Ethereum, the main public Ethereum blockchain is the layer one. On the mm -hmm. second layer, I can batch up a huge number of transactions, push them all at once onto the network, or just hold them in the secondary layer. So the layer twos, they're not quite as secure, but they're anchored to the main blockchain. They can handle really fast transaction processing times and very low costs. Mm -hmm. That's one big improvement. And for example, we're working with a layer two called Polygon. We're doing quite a bit of work with them. That's that's reduced our transaction cost by 90% over the last few weeks as we switched that on. Oh. The second thing that's happening is Ethereum itself is undergoing a transition from 1.0 to 2.0. That's going to hugely increase the capacity. And then within the 2.0 roadmap, there's a concept called sharding, which allows for multiple networks to operate together in a way that, that further multiplies the scale. So I feel confident that there's a roadmap to get scale that's larger and faster than the rate at which transaction volumes are at the moment. All right. Well, much more to be said on this topic in future. But right now, Paul Brody of EY, thank you so much for helping us understand just where blockchain is as technology for visibility, for supply chain management, for the autonomous supply chain. Thanks very much for being with me today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me.